dialogue assassination with KLRB. I'm Gloria Barron. Oh, May, when you came in today, the um, news machine had just finished reporting um, something that was rather startling, and I should tell our audience that we are recording this on Tuesday, September 14th. And this morning, um, the UPI came across with this. Uh, a medical examiner says that eight of the 10 hostages killed in the Attica prison riot in New York died of gunshot wounds. Earlier, it had re been reported that their throats were cut. Do you want to um, make a comment on that, May? Well, I personally feel we shouldn't get started. I'm very bitter. <laughs> and uh, about the fourth broadcast we made, Gloria, somebody, I was just giving out facts, I think, on the Robert Kennedy case in Los Angeles and the evidence that had been fouled up and mishandled and a few personal observations. And one of my close friends said, May, you sounded bitter on that broadcast. And I thought it was pretty academic because uh, I had prepared a lot of material. This is called Dialogue Assassination. And every week, we're trying to call attention to the fact that the political assassinations of, of leaders in the United States are tied in to current news today. And it is very difficult for me, I pre after preparing a week's information um, during the week, to pick up Sunday's paper and have 10 or 12 articles of the kind that I read. And I just ready to throw my hands there and say, oh, forget it. There is no hope in this country. And then on the other hand, I have this conflict because we're on the air this week. And um, I did a K show on KIDD for an hour, question and answers. And there'll be a television show, local television, Sunday night. 7 to 7.30, so we are getting exposure to the information. So I'll talk to you about political assassinations and the scene in New York. But I predicted that in, after my research in 64 and 1965, that the line of evidence that I saw of what happened and what was happening in the United States because of the way the murder of John Kennedy was covered up, that we would be in a total police state by 1972. And I've said on other shows that this is going to be the bloodiest country. It's going to be another Vietnam. And I could just do one show on all the animations of this coming to a head. And this country will be unlivable by 1972. No place and no person will be safe. And the Attic in New York thing, people who never listen to me talk about political assassinations, shake their head and say, isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? As if it wasn't planned. Just last night I was reading an issue of computer and automation that I told you they run a series on political assassinations. I was reading the chapter over again on how many coincidences make a conspiracy. And it's very interesting. They, a, Mr. Berkeley, who graduated from Harvard, come along, who, he got all kinds of honors at Harvard University and does studies on probability and coincidences and feeds them into computers now, had a whole quotation from a study of Nazi Germany. And in order, after World War I, and in order for Hitler to take over in 32, 400 political leaders were killed. And this computers and automation goes into a detailed study of Nazi Germany and then relates it to the killing of the Black Panthers in this country and to what's going to happen in a political assassination. 400 <coughs> leaders were killed in order to take the power. And they had to have an appearance of a system of justice so that the trials all along, as these people were murdered, um, the guilty ones were made to look innocent, and the innocent were twisted around to look guilty. And the analytical study of Nazi Germany is very important. It's important for my research because I feel that the cartels, the German cartels, the Nazis that didn't want to coexist with the Soviet Union took over our complete State Department and Pentagon and killed our president and candidates and they're killing the civil rights leaders and the black leaders or the whites. If they have to, it can't stay. And this is not a coincidence. All these names and orders can all be tied together. Now, what you get in New York is a group of men asking for a set of prison conditions to be changed. And 500 state troopers went in, 200 more troopers went in, 50 National Guards came with 600 more troops, helicopters were over the sky. Then the sheriff's deputy from the county around, 14 surrounding counties, came in their own automobiles with deer rifles, pistols, surplus army carbines, and shotguns, and were given riot helmets 
yellow and orange rain flickers and so forth. Now, up to that point, the hostages weren't even touched. And it is a terrible condition. Now, President Nixon has come in and he said, we approve. And this article in the morning paper says that Governor Rockefeller, he's been charged of using these murders for a political ploy. You better believe by 72, and I mentioned this on another show for those of you who take the tapes every week and listen, the excuse for taking over is the country will not be livable, and you better believe that it's not going to be. Now, it doesn't surprise me that the men who went into the prison to save the hostages shot them themselves or lied that their throats were cut, because no amount of investigation that they do will do anything but back up what I am saying about the forces that are in power today. And what you have in this state, you have Soledad and you have San Quentin, and our prison system is just like Auschwitz. And you have Governor Reagan coming in at this end, and he's going to take a trip with Air Force One and a presidential plane this week and go to South Korea and Formosa, Taiwan, and make another excursion duplicating the Agnew trip. Ronald Reagan shouldn't even leave this state. It is so horrendous. If you people in California can't believe that he has no business leaving this state and going to Asia, and I feel that part of the sending him there is that he's never really been into the international thing. And there's a very good chance that Richard Nixon's going to be killed. And you couldn't nominate a man like Reagan or push him into a position if he didn't know something about world affairs. We did with Agnew, it didn't work. So they're going to send him on these junkets where he doesn't belong. He belongs right home in this state. And Mrs. Jackson is saying today in the newspaper that she wants her son's death investigated in front of the United Nations. Now, you have all the evidence of that murder in San Quentin that has not gone into. You have the Bobby Kennedy thing in Los Angeles. You have Evelyn Younger, the Attorney General of the state, named in a conspiracy of murdering Robert Kennedy. The mayor of New York, of Los Angeles, Mary Yorty, named in this suit. You have Governor Ronald Reagan with these murders going on and the massacres of families like the Oda or the Sharon Tate massacre. You have a state of Earl Warren covering up the Warren report. This state is so filled with intrigue and conspiracy and the same kind of thing that put Hitler into power. And it's going to be election year. And I don't know, Gloria, the killing of these men and the hostages is understandable when life is expendable and you want power. And the evidence will come out, like the Kent State, the private investigator that did the Kent State, got information, the man from New York, that, that a gun was to be a signal to shoot into two particular kids. They'd take four if they had to. The sound recordings of the shooting have been verified. A gun did go off as a signal, and John Mitchell says the case is closed. So I, I think this, the helicopters and the gunning and calling in the neighbors with their hunting rifles is just the beginning. The third world or the world revolution has started, and people don't want to see it. They really don't want to know what's happening, and they don't know how the people in power got to power, and they will give them more approval, more guards, more care, and these are the political assassination teams that are tightening their power in 72, just as I predicted. <clears throat> now, in San, in San Jose State, the president there, I'll write to him this week, the president of the college, John H. Bunzel, had an article in the Mercury this morning accusing Ronald Reagan of some heavy charges of ruining the California educational system. If Mr. Bunzel wanted to get away from the theoretical and get to the very practical. He could get the newspapers in Florida that I've mentioned where Ronald Reagan and Governor Kirk met. And Governor Kirk, in his campaign a few years ago, said he wanted to break the University of California. And on another show we mentioned how he and Ronald Reagan had lunch in California as soon as they were elected and Clark Kerr was then fired in the University of California and our educational system has been put down. Now the president of San Jose College has a, a long article with a lot of charges. But he comes to this remark in his opening day speech. He says, against the backdrop of political and social turbulence, we are witnessing a significant redistribution of power, authority, and influence in the academic world. In its own way, it is a major revolution. For at stake, it is nothing less than our own independence and autonomy. Now, the people that know anything about economic problems that are more than, than Mr. Connolly 
say we're, I'm going to read some articles on the economy, and we'll talk about that. Say we're in a really tough way. We're going to a police state with these controls that Richard Nixon put. We are riding our own ticket to fascism. The academic world is saying there's a fascism. The convicted are saying our evidence that we're innocent is being destroyed. We're not getting fair trials. Uh, the news media is crying. I'm going to read you an article uh, that came out Sunday on crying about the news media and fascism. Everybody at every level is going to hurt. And they're going to hurt, be hurt because the power was usurped. And until you find out who did these murders, what fingerprints were on the guns, and call in the people who did it. If they can kill your leaders, they're going to kill you. And they're going to kill those <coughs> hostages. They didn't think a thing about shooting those hostages down, evidently, and blaming the other group. And everybody wants quick answers. They want to be told, it's, we'll get more guards and you'll be safe. Now, at San Quentin last week, after the, the problem that they had over at the San Quentin jail, so new guards were hired, and 21 applied right away. Now, it is a very happy job, and you wonder why in the hell they would want it. But the important thing is this. A newspaper man writing the article said that the people that came were very secretive about their background and their motives for wanting to be guards. Now, anybody who cared about the prison system would have to have, I should think, publicly the application of the guards and what state they came from and where they worked and what was their training. Are they coming from Fort Ord? Are they, if you're in a police state, if you're in a military type government, where are the guards who are secretive about their background going to? Because you will get more killings at San Quentin and the hostages someday are going to be you. It's going to be outside the prison walls. It's going to be everywhere. And until the people can see that their lives, we, we've said before, until they can see that their lives are related to what's happening. Now, the cover-up for the New York thing and for San Quentin is going to be that outside influences are coming in and changing the system and arousing these people. I had <clears throat> did a lot of work at Fort Ord when the mutiny trial was there for the boys who disliked the prison conditions at the stockade in San Francisco. And these boys sat on the ground 20 of them, and they chanted that there was sewage on the floor and feces floating around and no pipes to take the stuff away and the food was bad and they were overcrowded in these rooms and they shot this bunch uh, who, who was just a mentally disturbed boy who walked away and they just shot him back in front of the other boys. And the conditions at, for at Presidio Stockade were so bad, and I kept a list of them, that the fellows, there was a confrontation, should we have a violent scene here or should we sit down and chant? And they chose to sit down and chant. And right away the Presidio officials said we can't have this. So the first sentence was 20 years in jail and the next was 16 years in jail. And people became incensed and furious that this was too strict for these men. One man wanted leave because his wife had the children and um, she was away drinking. The kids were alone in the house and he couldn't get a pass. So he went AWOL and he was stuck in the stockades and then given 16 years for Seeing who his babies were alone in an apartment, this kind of thing. So as a result of people in the community, in this community, in Monterey, Carmel, and Pacific Grove, about 20 of us, going to the trials every day and writing to Stanley Reeser and the White House and so forth, the boys are all out of jail now. They're not hurting anybody. Uh, the longest had a sentence of maybe two years, somewhere out in three months. And I feel very proud that we were able to reduce all of these sentences and uh, I had the telephone number of the White House I called night and day and and really bothered them in fact I was invited to be on a commission to go into crime in the state and I'm sorry I didn't but I was working on assassinations but outside people who care <clears throat> about these things will begin to see that the complaints may be legitimate and in our police state they're going to crack down on people like me that are saying uh, these things are provoked in order to get more power. They are provoked, and, and the people inside the prison who are talking about legitimate complaints are forced into a position, and then the blood spills, and then you get more guards. Do you think there's still time to um, rectify <coughs> these? I don't think so. I, I, I'm not in a bad mood today, I told you. you I, think there's, today. I think there's a conspiracy to take over this government like there was in Nazi Germany and make an absolute fascism. I think there's a conspiracy 
to hide who did it because you'll gain political power and you don't want to rock the boat and it's expedient not to stir up problems that may put us in a bad light in Europe. And then there's a general indifference of 90% of the people who really don't care. That, that's probably the problem area. Um, it's the problem area. Well, let's be specific. We've been on this show 11 weeks and I talk about political assassinations and I did a whole show on Jack Anderson's article called Balderdash uh, in which he in the New Orleans paper talked about a document by Don Riley in San Francisco that's in Washington now naming the people who killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. And I called attention to the fact that the Monterey Herald never carried the article nor did the San Francisco Chronicle or San Jose Mercury or the LA Times. And that we've been on this show, we were already on about eight weeks, and that this should be of interest to the local people because we build up a good following here in Santa Cruz, but nothing was in the paper. Well, the Monterey Herald obliged me, and they did print that article August 29th, just a week and a half ago. And they didn't call the title Balderdash. They called it Conspiracy. Now, there's a lot of people here, informers or people listening from the FBI or the CIA who take down what I'm t saying and send to Washington. I know that's happening. But among my friends or my fans or the people that write letters or that call the studio or call me, who listen every week, who take tapes, they don't take the New York Times or any of the other papers I take. Some of them take the Herald, and some don't even take that. And when the Herald actually writes about this document, not one person that I know picked it up and said, May, it was in the paper. And I, this is the way people are reading, even the, intelli even the people that agree with me. And that's the problem. I mean, that is the problem right there. I, I'm ready to throw up my hands. The government doesn't have to stop me from talking because the people I'm talking to can't follow it through. Now, you take the other side, the conservatives, and I think of the uh, survival of the fittest argument or Ayn Rand and, and the political conservatives. If they have an idea, they file it, they cross file, they write a letter, they support the man who supports what they think. They tell their people to go to these places and support it. They follow it through. They have something to say. They've got their money, they've got their property, and their white skin, and they want, they're pretty secure, and they know what they want. And by golly, they'll go to hell and back to back it up. And I have always respected the conservative, the actual conservative, in that sense. He'll go to hell and back to back it up. But the so-called educated, the liberal, the person who is with you, he can't follow it through. And um, it's a really, oh, it's a sad situation because he can't say, oh, wow, our paper had it, or say, did you see this, or make copies. Nobody knows how to read a paper or reads a paper. And there's many people who call me, somebody called me a close friend, and they go to marches, they war protests, they go to hell and back to, out in the fields with Cesar Chavez, and you have a program on political assassination. And you talk about how Chavez can be killed, too, if he goes too far. And these people will support these causes at a very low level. But if you say, did you hear the show this week? Oh, we don't have FM. They're too sophisticated to listen to anything. Or did you read the paper? Oh, I wouldn't read the paper anymore because it's all bad news. Bad news. Yeah. How could you possibly know what is happening in the world? And those are the people that... if. As I say, the conservative knows what he wants to save. If the liberal wants to save his life, if he wants equal job opportunities, if he wants to see that maybe 10,000 people don't control the entire economy of this nation or the world, uh, he's not doing anything about it. And I really feel bitter because he, he just can't move himself to effect a change. It's, not, it's expedient to talk, but it isn't expedient to change. We did get a flood of letters. Now, um, the man that I always talk about, Medford Evans, who writes for John Birch Society, the um, American Opinion. I read him every month. His big book reviews are brilliant. He's perfectly honest. And uh, one listener who likes the shows has tried to influence her mother to hear the tapes that they send back to Florida. And the mother said, well, you're quoting The Nation. What is The Nation uh, magazine? Who prints it? Who says it? She wanted to read the article about Bud Fenster Walt's committee. So today I thought I would just read you a book review of Special Unit Senator by Medford Evans. It was an American opinion of this year, November 1970. 
and he talks about Sirhan Sirhan and and how when the guerrillas hijacked the jet planes last year, the Palestinians wanted Sirhan out of San Quentin in exchange. Medrid Evans says, now these are his quotes, nothing is more vital to the establishment than the denial of conspiracy at high level. The hard line is that nothing serious ever happens, at least in the United States, as a result of the conspiracy. To hold this line, the Warren Report was prepared, declaring that Oswald was a loner. In the book, Special Unit Senator, it serves the same purpose. Robert Houghton, Chief of Detectives in L.A., who must, however, be a more modest man than Earl Warren, he says there is no evidence of conspiracy. He means no evidence that would stand up in court. And there's no evidence, he says, that would stand up in any present-day federal court of any kind. Logically, he said, there's a highly persuasive evidence that Sirhan Sirhan was involved in a conspiracy. Successful conspiracies lose and often deliberately sacrifice certain members, but they do not leave evidence in a lawyer's sense of the word. And Mr. Uton says there was no evidence. If Sirhan is also a fall guy, he goes on to say, he was used by the Arab Israeli group and the politically oriented in Los Angeles. Politics means an association to gain or hold power through concerted action. And the only thing that distinguishes political action from conspiratorial action is that the former does not have to be criminal. Conspirators do not have to communicate explicitly with each other. Remember the Warren Report under conspiracy where the right wing was brought in and they had six pages clearing the Dallas oil people of conspiracy and John Kennedy. And they said, because there's no evidence that Ruby knew Oswald, there could be no conspiracy. And I did a show on this showing just how wrong this was. And Medford Evans quotes the case of the Rosenbergs in which they were killed for a conspiracy, which is much less uh, obvious than the one in Los Angeles. And Medford Evans says an explicit or formal agreement is not necessary. When Sir Hen killed Kennedy, he said, I did it for my country. Now the revolution of his country is required to do something for him. And he repeated several times, I did it for my country. Medford Evans says in, in special unit senator, there were reasons to conclude there was a conspiracy to murder Robert Kennedy. I wish the books had an index to facilitate checking every reference to particular names and a floor plan. He wrote this in the same month, I mean the quote here, the same month that this book review was done. Computers and automation did an index of the book for researchers because it was not indexed to see which witnesses were not called. Back <clears throat> to Medford Evans in American Opinion. Every enfranchised American has a responsibility to question as thoroughly as possible the circumstances of an event which suggest that violence has a veto over the nomination for the presidency. Even if the said American didn't like the particular candidate whose case got vetoed, some were robbed of the chance for Bobby to vote for him, and the rest of us the chance to vote against him. But if there was a conspiracy to kill him, we all need to know it. This is the John Birch Society saying, I would be glad to vote against him, but we should have had a chance to do it. And then he goes into how Bobby Kennedy got into the ambassador pantry and mentions in his article a Bill Barry, who was Kennedy's bodyguard, who decided to change and go to a different direction because they, people would find out which way the senator was going to go. Um, end quotes. Remember last week I said that Bill Barry was the ex-FBI man who was supposed to be front man for Robert Kennedy and he was behind the line with Ethel, and Ethel said, what are you doing here? You should be up there with Bobby. Well, the John Birch Society is calling attention that Bill Barry, the guard for Robert Kennedy, was the man who took him through the kitchen and is suggesting very strongly the involvement of Bob Barry in directing him through that pantry where Sirhan was waiting. He says the last-minute decision by Bill Barry and Fred Dunn may have been to increase Bobby's security, but it resulted in his isolation in the presence of his assassin who was waiting there. But nothing is more incredible than the fact that Bill Barry, whom Chief Houghton calls Kennedy's sole experienced bodyguard, locked his hand over the hand with a gun later and then turned it away from Sir Han. The, now, Medford Evans says the great spate of books on the Kennedy assassination in Dallas began two or three years after the coup d'etat of November 22, 63. 
Perhaps especially in the center will be the beginning of a similar outpouring regarding the Kennedy assassination in Los Angeles. More has been done, as a matter of fact, regarding the Kennedy affair at Chappaquiddick. The Los Angeles case may be the toughest of the three to write about, because even more obviously than the others, it raises the question of original protective responsibility. Dealey Plaza is a large area. Chappaquiddick was dark and lonely, but the death in the Ambassador Hotel was small and well-lighted and easy to control. Now, <clears throat> if conservatives do not like by quoting certain articles that they think are slanted, <clears throat> I will read you every week from the American opinion. The policy has been to say it was a coup d'etat. The conspirators are out on the streets, and the country cannot run efficiently. And I think they <clears throat> I brought in another article by um, uh, the same gentleman, Medford Evans, that I can read later. But I want to jump to some other subjects that were in the news this week, where he goes into the conspiracies in Dallas. Now, there was an article, Sunday's paper, Hypocrite of the Week. We talked about, we had a candidate last week, Representative McCloskey, was going to go for truth in government. And Ernest Conine in the San Jose Mercury called out about the Hypocrite of the Week. The, he, he said, the present-day folk hero, now this is very interesting, Ernest Cohen, I said, the present-day folk hero is the fellow who stands right in and tells it like it is, who lets it all hang out regardless of consequences. He who gets a reputation for speaking with a forked tongue is lost. I got a letter from somebody in Seaside saying, you're my, you're my heroine. You know, I, I love what you're saying, and it's really great. And I would like to be that kind of folk hero who lets it all hang out, who says the truth. But the hypocrite of the week went to Representative Paul McCloskey, who's running on truth in government. And then the second award went to Reagan, who said that taxes should hurt, and then didn't pay any taxes last year on the, on the street. And the third hypocrite was when Muskie said he didn't think a black vice president would win, and Samuel, he said, oh, I'd be glad to have a vice president my running mate, what, after what he did to Bradley in a slap in the face in Los Angeles. The article says, all those Democratic liberals who've been demanding a reordering of national priorities have something to do, too. Well, this is what we're talking about on the show, really. Um, the hypocrites, who are threatening, 72 is coming up or it's not coming up. And every day the newspaper is just filled with what candidates will do or won't do. And it is obscene. The only word is obscene. There is nothing in those things that touches truth. Now, Mr. Talcott, Representative Talcott, <clears throat> called from Washington to Salinas to see what was going on at KLRB. I talked with his secretary. Representative Talcott came to Carmel. He talked at the golf club over in the valley, one mile from my home. He couldn't come to my home. He talked to the women, the Republican Party, there on low-cost housing in the Soviet Union. I mean, he's going back to Washington. Here's a talk of overchanging <clears throat> the system of government in Washington. And he is talking about housing in the Soviet Union. Yeah, he did, uh, with all um, <coughs> due respect to uh, Representative Talcott, he did send you a message through us. He at, sent a message that he yes. didn't want to ignore me, but he was too busy. But he did go. That he will be back and yeah, but you just see, talk with you. He's not going to handle this. He is not going to. Let's call him what he is. Uh, that is the gentleman's way of doing it. He talked to the League of Women Voters on issues in the country. He didn't talk about the political assassination. I'm talking about the usurping of power. And he wants to be, he will be a congressman who decides whether men will be tried for murder or impeached. And he doesn't want, he doesn't want to be knowledgeable on that vote. You see, he's one mile from my house, Gloria. And he's talking about low-cost housing in Yugoslavia. If we stop the war for one day, we could put low-cost housing in any city of America for one day. We have enough money. I'll take a break here. You're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel. This is KLRB Stereo FM Carmel by the Sea. All right, Mae, we're back. Uh, I see an article, the Washington Merry-Go-Round Viet Peace Plan. What's the Viet Peace Plan? This is by Jack Anderson. Well, yeah. Jack Anderson had an article uh, this week on President Nixon's foreign policy. And that the U.S. is going to play China against Russia. And that's quite obvious what we're going to do. We're not going to 
go too far into the China dealing, but we're getting Russia pretty angry about what's happening. And Jack Ann said the Kremlin is almost neurotic in its suspicion that China is trying to cook up an anti-Soviet deal with the U.S. Well, I bring up that article because two weeks ago we started reading from a magazine called Sputnik, a Reader's Digest type of magazine from the Soviet Union. It's a monthly magazine. And the July issue and the August-September are carrying a series on the Dallas tragedy and the killing of John Kennedy. And for background, for those who didn't listen, uh, for seven years the Soviet Union has not touched the political assassinations in this country. And I always felt that this was the blackmail that they had over us escorting in Vietnam or using atomic bombs, that they could overthrow the people who run this country by disclosing the truth on the John Kennedy murders. And for seven years they've kept quiet, although they did say enough. Like the first articles from Izvestia a task agency said Oswald was an agent of the CIA, and then they kept quiet. And so the, the Soviet Union held this over us for seven years, and now they're coming out publishing the details of the John Kennedy murder. And my reasoning or explanation was that if we get too friendly with China and play against Russia, who has not been an ally in any sense of the word, but we have recognized them more than China, they will continue to feed information and facts on the John Kennedy murder. That was my opinion of why it was coming out. And when I finished the article, the first article on Sputnik, and I'll be reading more, they mentioned uh, the author was asked, why are you bringing this out now? And he says, well, I think it's a good time. It's a kind of a blackmail. And they said, what are you saying? It's pure blackmail? And he said, well, yes, it is. And the author was at the nomination of John Kennedy in Los Angeles representing Taft, and he's followed this murder, John Kennedy continuously in office and his murder. And now he feels that he wants to tell what happened. And we read two weeks ago a section of Sputnik because I want you to see what the people in the Soviet Union are learning about the United States now. And I left off reading the route, the decision of the route and the placing of Lee Oswald in the book depository, who did it, their jobs and connections. So. I'm going to go on, if some of you missed the background of up to the place in the depository, I'm going to have to go forward and then get some of these other tapes typed up for you. Uh, Sputnik says, in the final count, the riddle of Dallas would be more than half solved if the world could learn that the vice president's true motives when he insisted on his president traveling to Texas and particularly to Dallas. Accidents, including planned accidents, including accidents to presidents, do happen. And in the circumstances, it is not surprising, even America, that the Johnsons have been compared to the Macbeths. On the third or fourth day, I'm quoting Sputnik now, after the assassination in Dallas, uh, uh, President Johnson's brother was in San Antonio, and he called the president and said, I guess you're pretty busy. And the president said, yes, he just been off office a few days. And he thanked his brother for helping him with his campaigns and his work. And he said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. And Lyndon's brother said, Lyndon, I had nothing to do with Oswald. <laughs> this is in the book, My Brother Lyndon by Sam Houston Johnson. And <clears throat> the Soviet Union said, uh, printed the profanities that Johnson threw that I won't say over the air. And I've been pretty good, Gloria, about not using them on the station. Yes, you have to. Yeah, okay, I get a memo. Uh, then it goes on to say the reaction, the really heavy reaction that Lyndon Johnson had. The Sputnik goes on, what a commission, oh Lord. It says, first, the same day following the assassination, Lyndon Johnson decided that the investigating commission would be in Texas, and the new president did not want one representative of the federal government investigating the murder. Second, he wanted to publish the FBI report on the crime without showing it even to the Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Former aides of the assassinated president it says, um, were sure not to see this material because they would have a definite aim in mind. Unfortunately, I could not report these sensational facts at the time. For one thing, by their very nature, they suggested that the new president had an odd desire to avoid a broad, full-scale investigation of the murder. I brought with me a copy of a letter from the National, I mean to quote now, to say the National Archives documents that I've mentioned I'm receiving. I have a copy of a letter dated December the 8th from J. Edgar Hoover to Earl Warren. And 
uh, President Kennedy was dead just a few weeks, two weeks. And this is the way the letter reads. J. Edgar Hoover asked, mentions that Lyndon Johnson had called him and wants Earl Warren to take care of the conspiratory theories on the assassination. It says, Lyndon Johnson has asked me to call you, write to you, Earl Warren, and tell you that there are rumors. The Gallup poll says that 50% of the people at home and abroad don't believe there was no conspiracy. And your commission, you're going to have a commission now. See, it was out of the hands of the Texas officials and Lyndon Johnson appointed commission. And Earl Warren said, head it. Your commission will do its work. But I want you, in the meantime, to lay to rest the fears and the anxieties and say, number one, that all the evidence, fingerprints and the rifle and photographing and documents, places Oswald as a lone assassin. And number two, that Ruby had no connection with any group or government in this country or outside or group of people, that there was no conspiracy. So the conclusion of the Warren Report, which was to come out in September 1964, was ordered by Lyndon Johnson to J. Edgar Hoover to Earl Warren the first week of December 1963 still. So all of the work or research wouldn't matter. Everything that's piled up since, it doesn't really matter. The order came out. Now, when Earl Warren didn't want the position to head the commission, Lyndon Johnson said to him, if I were chief commander and you were in the service, would you take my order? And he said, yes. He said, well, I order you to take this commission, which he did. Now, uh, Sputnik goes into Johnson's abortive attempt to establish his Texas commission for hopes for uncovering the true reasons and the motives and the participants. <clears throat> John J. McCloy who in the past carried out delicate foreign assignments for the government, had a confidential discussion with representatives of foreign states as they arrived for the funeral, and bluntly demanded that the press in their country cease raising a fuss about the assassination and desist from the insinuations that there was a conspiracy. And McCloy threatened the United States' relations with these countries would deteriorate drastically. When the, I'm ending the quote now to say that the do, archives documents, which I'm getting, of the commission meeting say that when the Warren Report was finished, John J. McCoy and Alan Dulles and these men were to go to the heads of the press and governments in Europe, and they all made trips to Europe and promised them, don't you dare talk. The Warren Report is accurate. It's the last word. And it is in writing how they were to make the trips, who they were to talk to, what pressures they were to put. So when Sputnik comes out and says this role that McCoy had at the time of the funeral, I can't say it's not true because I have copies of the orders of the commission to put it down when it came out. And John J. McCoy's law firm in, in New York was a conduit for CIA operations, the biggest we have in this nation. In certain circles in America, they desired as little talk as possible about the conspiracy. The rest of the proceedings of the official investigation of the assassination showed it was directed by a hand accustomed to the cowboy tradition of breaking in a horse. <laughs> On November the 29th, President Johnson set a special commi commission. After category refusals with Earl Warren, he agreed to take the case. I saw George McBundy, this is how Warren says it, I saw George McBundy first and he took me in and said how serious the situation was, that there were wild rumors of an international situation. Dean Rusk talked to me. He mentioned the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, how millions of people would be killed in an atomic war if I didn't head this commission. The only way to dispel these rumors was to have an independent, responsible commission, and no one could head it but a highest judicial officer. And this is the quotation that he was given. You've been in uniform before, he said, and if I asked you, would you put on that uniform for your country? I said, of course. This is more important than that, he said. You're putting it like that, and I can't say no, Earl Warren said to our president. When you put it like that, I can't say no. Let us begin, I mean Sputnik, let us begin with Warren's initial refusal to take part in the commission. The Chief Justice explained his refusal that members of the Supreme Court shouldn't be asked outside of the framework of their court to direct these duties. But after all, he said, the country was rocked by the murder of its president, and before the eyes of America, the alleged assassin was killed, and the authorities in Dallas violated every principle of law. They utilized the mass media to convince the people of Oswald's guilt before any investigation was carried out. And it said the highest representative of the judiciary in the United States of America was pulled in then to back up 
the news media's reports, and within a few days after the commission was formed, Earl Warren made a sensational announcement about the facts and circumstances connected with the assassination of President Kennedy and that they would never be known during the lifetime of the present generation. And today, when most of the conclusions represented in the report of the Warren Commission have been disproved and not accepted in America or anywhere else, Warren's statement is completely comprehensible. Now, Sputnik <coughs> says the Dallas police announced that Oswald was a communist. And the same Johnson, who was the first and only member of the Kennedy cabinet to put forth the communist plot theory after the murder, a week later wanted to say it was a wild rumor that his commission would go into all this. But Earl Warren was caught in the hook of patriotism. And as far as I and the rest of the Soviet newsmen stationed in Washington were, Concerned nationally, we wondered how the communist conspiracy theory would hold up in the hands of the Warren Commission. Now, I'm going back now where this author says that the country was rocked with this murder and the authorities in Dallas violated the law and utilized the mass media to convince us of Oswald's guilt before the investigation was carried out. And I want to show you how the news media affects your life. We talked about today in New York in the prison where they say the hostages cut their throats and bloody way, and now we find out that they were shot by our own people coming in armed. But I brought a book which I love to read, and I told you I'd give book titles each week. It's called 70 Hours and 30 Minutes, and it is an education. It is a broadcast from the NBC Network, published by Random House. 70 Hours and 30 Minutes, it costs two ninety-five, and if you take what came over the news from Friday noon until Sunday evening and you analyze it. Then you can say what else can we believe or how can we go into it. My favorite quotation from the news was Sunday evening. I'm going to read you some of the news that came through till Sunday night. But at the end of the evening on Sunday night the Dallas police declared the case closed. They, the public official Henry Wade said our office has not closed the investigation. The Dallas police has said the case is closed. The district attorney hadn't yet closed it, he said, because there is no concrete evidence that Oswald killed this president, but there is no doubt in our minds that Oswald was the assassin. Now that is, our office has not closed it. The police have closed it. The district attorney hasn't closed it because there is no concrete evidence, but there's no doubt in our minds that he was the assassin. Now, that's pretty heavy because you're getting the same thing out of New York today. The 70 hours and 30 minutes to show you what came into your heads. A lot of people have asked me, Gloria, how did you get into the research? How did you get started? What are your motives? Um, uh, what got you into this thing? And I want to say that, uh, briefly, that some people hear news and they disbelieve it completely. Or they hear what a person says or what a doctor says. Like, you've got a lump on your breast. They don't hear them. They just go on. Some people don't hear anything that's said, and, or they take a bummer and negative and, and distort it. Some people hear something and they don't even know what they're hearing, and they push it away. And then there's a certain amount of people, for some reason or other, through education or perception, sensitivity, like we were saying before, who hear what they're hearing and want to know if what, it, what they hear is correct. So it's seven years later, and you've heard a lot about conspiracies, so I want to read just a few things that came off the NBC News because you sit every night and watch the news. And thinking back now, wouldn't you have been suspicious like I was? If you hear what came over the news, uh, I want to read you. At 1.45, they announced that President Kennedy was shot. I'm taking parts of this book, The Hour. This was on Friday. At 2.15, a young man was taken in custody protesting his innocence. At 2.45, NBC said a shot came from the right and rear and struck the president's head. At 3.13, the weapon was found. It was a British 303 rifle with a telescopic sight. And the Secret Service agent also had been killed. It said at 3.15, a Secret Service agent was killed and a Dallas policeman. Now, at 3.15, a German Mauser was found and three bullets were used. So the British 303 became a German Mauser. Later, 24 hours later, it's to be in Washington. It's going to be an Italian carcano, and it's going to have printed on the bottom of it, made in Italy. And it's going to weigh differently than these things, but in the building were these other guns. Now, uh, I have to keep breaking from this and end the quote there and just intersperse another thing in the information I have coming 
from the National Archives on this evidence. There was so there was so much evidence coming in of different guns, and Roy truly was asked, and this is verified, to fingerprint the people in his building that worked there, and he refused to do it. He said they would leave and we'd close down the building. They wouldn't fingerprint his employees to see if any fingerprints were on any of these guns or what windows they were in. Roy truly absolutely for, forbid the commission to fingerprint the the employees in the depository. So you're told that 313 is British 303. At 315, that's a 245. At 315, you get a, a German Mauser. At 356, Lyndon Bain Johnson took the oath of office sworn in by District Judge Sarah Hughes. End quote here in Dallas, Texas. It, 1967, February the 18th, it was disclosed that a charitable foundation intimately associated with the Republic National Bank and major companies served as a channel for at least over $500,000 in CIA funds since 1958, and one of the foundation's trustees is federal judge Sarah T. Hughes, who administered the oath of office to President Johnson following the assassination of John Kennedy. Now back to our 70 hours and 30 minutes. At 5.36, Oswald was seemed to be the prime suspect, according to the newsman. Remember, later we have no other suspect at all, but he's the prime. At 544, all circumstantial evidence points to the guilt of Lee Oswald. But now it seems it was not a right wing, it was a left wing pro-communist plot. This is at 5 in the afternoon. He's saying he's innocent. It's pro-communist. At 825 in the evening, the prime suspect is still saying he is innocent. He didn't do it. At 9 o'clock, Oswald insists he had nothing to do with it. Now, at 9.48, Friday evening, information is coming in on Oswald. It, the news said this. Oswald was arrested in New Orleans for handing out literature on fair play for Cuba. He said he was a Marxist. He was married in Russia. He was in the building where the shots that killed Kennedy were fired. Now, if you analyze those things, and when they're asked why they closed the case, they listed that he was in New Orleans with communist literature, that he was a Marxist, he married a Russian, and that he was in the building where the shots were fired. When you do your research, or when you think of a crime, you think of a weapon, weapon ownership, fingerprints, bullet direction, how many bullets in the car, uh, other people that saw a gunman leave the grass, you know, you go with the ballistics, you don't go with these things, because when you do seven years research, it turned out the fair play for Cuba didn't exist there, he was the only man there, and it was a front for his CI activity. He was married in Russia, he was brought over by our State Department, and Senator John Tower, he wrote to Tower for permission to come back. Tower is so far right, he makes a Tower piece that just, you know, look like uh, staying straight up. I mean, Senator Tower is a very arch conservative. Why would Oswald write to him when he hates America so much? All of Oswald's links were with the right wing and John Connolly and the State Department. So being married in Russia has nothing to do with any of this. None of the things that they re reason for his being the killer have anything to do with the actual crime. At 10, 11 p.m., they said that Oswald was given $437 by our own State Department to be returned from Moscow. And late in the evening after midnight, Oswald said, I didn't shoot anybody. Saturday morning, John McCone, head of the CIA, was conferring with President Johnson in the White House at 10.06. At 10.11, Saturday morning, the Dallas police are convinced that Lee Oswald is guilty, but they have no confession or admission of his guilt. 10.54, on uh, the news, NBC News, the fingerprints on the rifle were only partial and cannot be identified as Oswald. They were airlifted to Washington. Mr. Latone, who's worked with the FBI for 35 years, powdered them, photographed them, examined them, did every ballistic test, and said there are no fingerprints of Lee Oswald on this Italian Carcano, and the news is telling you that he's guilty because he married in Russia. But they're telling you on NBC News, you listened that day, and, and it's in writing here, you can read it, but this is what I was hearing, that the fingerprints cannot be identified as Oswald. At 12.43, Jesse Curry, chief of police, said Oswald brought a large package to work with him, and he was on the sixth floor around noon. Now, that's a big deal. <laughs> you know, he brought something with him. They said at 1 o'clock, paraffin test proved he fired the rifle. That later was thrown out. At 2 o'clock on Saturday, the Dallas police said there is sufficient evidence to convict Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, this is what the Soviet Union is saying. The news media controlled this country and gave you a pat answer. And I'm reading NBC News. I'm not reading the offbeat stations, the ones that are subsidized by the anti-war people. I mean, the establishment, 
NBC News coming out of Dallas and Washington with he and your top reporters. And they're telling you, they're, they're saying at 2 o'clock on Saturday there was sufficient evidence to convict Oswald. At 3.16, the people who knew Oswald came in, and this is nice research on the Dallas people, people who knew Oswald said he was a bookish introvert, a loner. Well, if you're an agent, you're a loner anyway. It, it has nothing to do with his being alone. He saw people, and we know the apartments they met and the banks he went to and what transacted. Being alone doesn't mean you murdered John Kennedy. And this is, this is the way the American people were brainwashed. Uh, at 3.15, in the Saturday, he said he was on inactive reserve with a dishonorable ris ris discharge. That has been thrown out. He went out of the Marines with an honorable discharge. It goes on, he traveled to Russia, affirmed his allegiance to the Soviet Union, and wrote to Senator Tower of Texas asking help to return. We've gone into that. Saturday, they said photographs have been shown of Oswald holding the rifle. They were found in the garage the day of the assassination. The Dallas police came in, and with the help of Mrs. Payne and Marina Oswald, they took boxes out, put them in the car, and took them away. No inventory, no list in front of any person. They returned them Saturday morning, and Mrs. Payne left her house. Her husband left the house, and no one was home. And the FBI goes through the box and say, oh, here's a negative of Oswald holding a rifle. And that's how they were found. Now, Sunday morning, the Dallas police declared at 1038, the Dallas police declared the case, the Oswald case, closed. And this is Sunday morning at 1038. The case was completely closed. Sunday evening, the Dallas police force declared the Oswald case was closed officially. Henry Wade, district attorney, made a public statement. When he was asked the evidence upon which he closed his case, he said, a number of witnesses saw someone with a gun in the window. Number two, the gun used to murder the president was purchased from a mail order house in Chicago. Number three, an assumed name ordered the gun, the same name that Oswald used. Number three, is the fourth thing was witnesses saw him stop and reload a gun and enter a theater. The next reason was his fingerprints were found on a rifle, which was absolutely not true. At 10.39, Sunday evening, the Dallas District Attorney's Office knew that there were no fingerprints, and they're telling the people in America they saw them. And the next reason was a paraffin test showed he fired a rifle recently, and this was thrown out. So he said, our office, this is the quotation, I had before, our office has not closed the investigation as there is no concrete evidence, but there is no doubt in our mind that Oswald was the assassin. Well, I was sitting home listening to the same news that you were and everybody else was. And I know that someone saying a man in a window had a gun, it could even be a Secret Service man guarding the motorcade, that he purchased it from a mail order house while Oswald was alive. They said, did you order this gun from Klein? He said, I had no gun. If it came, it came in my wife's name. I never owned a gun. The gun had no fingerprint when he's saying, and there was a whole chain of where this rifle came from later. The fact that he used an assumed name when the commission met and Gerald Ford, arch conservative and, and a respectable member of Congress, writes a book on the assassination of John Kennedy and tells how the commission met and the Dallas officials came in with evidence that Oswald was an agent of the FBI and gave his number and his aliases and his box number. Uh, alias names were used as agents. You have many names, you have multiple names. The fact that he has an alias, Alec Heidel, in his wallet doesn't mean that somebody that doesn't want to frame him didn't order the gun with that alias, knowing that he's an a that's his agent name. And then witnesses saw him stop and reload the gun entering a theater. That has nothing to do with the tippet autopsy, the tippet evidence of where he was, who he knew, how he was placed in the Oak Cliff section. Who saw a getaway car with, with two people get in there, saw Oswald leaning on the window talking to Tippett in a friendly manner? The fact that he reloaded a gun, if he's an agent of any kind, he left his money at home, he left a letter at home and all this, but if he had a role as a decoy, it doesn't matter. Sure, he may have a gun for defense, because they may think, you know, like you're a suspect. He may have a gun, and they take it from him. The gun didn't match up the bullets to Tippett's body, so it doesn't matter what he reloaded or loaded. So when the Soviet Union talks about the news media keeping the truth from the American people, uh, you may say, I don't trust the Soviet Union, but my research is saying that they're not accepting the blackmail. We're going to go with China now and turn our back on you. I think the Soviet Union will remind the officials of this government and help find out who usurped this power if we get too 
involved in turning against them. I, mean, I, I feel that it, it's a um, power play, like I've said before, and that they're going to watch the people in Washington. And I think the Soviet Union fears 72 as much as I do. Oh, do you want to do you want to wrap it up now? Maybe we have about four minutes about left. Um, or do you want to well, we outline can, what we're going to do next week? No, well, you know, I, I say, well, I'll do a certain thing, and then I have so much material. I would like, I typed out this week about ten different subjects that if nothing really important comes in the news, we could do one hour on each of those subjects. But these things like the New York and the using, I have said, and I've said it from the first shows, that you're going to see a lot of confrontation and killing of the leaders, of the black leaders, and white leaders and uh, 72 is going to be unlivable. And I just wish people would begin to think of this as either we're going to wake up and use a form of action. I, I will speak to you and try to tell you that if you care, you have to get involved. You can't say, I really like organic food and I don't like sprayed food and I want my garden, but there's this TV special on tonight, or did you meet, meet the press, or did you this or that. If you want to grow vegetables, you find out what kind of seeds and manure, and you do the best you can. If you want to find out who's running your government, you're going to have to get the books and read it and subscribe to a paper and care. You know, you can't call me or take up my time and say, did you see this or that? And I say, well, did you read the Herald last night? You mean it's a full Herald, and they don't even see it. I, I think that you people have to decide if I am giving you information, if you're going to use it as a political tool and not just a hobby to say, well, I'm listening to Mae Russell. If you're not going to use it as a political tool, I'm not going to stop working for you. I'll just grow tomatoes. So I think you have to decide if you're going to take some of this seriously, even one fraction of it, and try to effect a change. Uh, and if you don't know how to start or where to start, just keep writing public officials. Write to those candidates or, or people and say, this is important, or, or Representative Talcott, you are one mile from May Brussels. Why is housing in the Soviet Union more important than the Republican Party? I would like the same people that invited Bert Talcott to talk about Russia to invite me to talk to the Republican Party on why their party would be affected by the changes, or the League of Women Voters. I'll go to them and talk to their group and tell them why this should be on the ballot and not ignored, that these things are the primary things and not the last things to be discussed. In election year, they're talking about all the priorities, and this is the only, the only issue now is, first of all, will you have an election, and who took the power, and how can you remove them? I don't want hangings or, or death penalties, but I do think the people involved in these assassinations should maybe put in one train, like a search of them, parade around the country, and then let free, let everyone see them, because they're normal people, like your neighbors or you or me. You can't separate who's doing these things. And I think you should just see who is planning the overthrow of the government, like the people that killed the 400 leaders in Germany before Hitler came in. I think they have identifications, and we should just really see what people are trying to do to us. I don't know if it's possible. And then you want people to continue to write. I want them to write. Officials. I want them to scream and yell, and I'll go talk to them, and, and on a reasonable, non-emotional basis, try to explain why the political assassinations are the only issue of 1972. It's either that or a police state. Thank you, May.